Thank you um, to all of you for coming this afternoon. You're in for a treat, is all I'm going to say. Um, so just to say a little bit about the format of what's going to happen. So um, I will say a little bit of an introduction. I'll keep it very brief because I know we're all really here wanting to hear what Gus has to say. And so then Gus will speak for around um, half an hour. Um, there'll be myself and Gus in conversation just to give you a chance to think about the questions you want to ask. And then there'll be plenty of time for Q&A right at the end of the event. All I will say, and I will remind you of this, because we're recording the event, in the Q&A, please wait for the microphones to come to you so that we can capture your, I'm sure, amazing and intriguing questions um, in response to Gus's talk. So just a little bit about um, Gus, first of all. So as Laurie has said, um, Dr. Casely Hayford is the inaugural director of v &A East. He was appointed in 2020. He's a curator and cultural historian who writes lectures, gives broadcasts widely on culture, having presented a number of series, not just for BBC, but also for Sky, for television, and for other channels beyond the BBC and so on. He's formerly executive director of Art Strategy, Arts Council England, and ex-director of the Institute of International Contemporary Art. He's offered leadership to both large and medium scale organizations, including the Smithsonian, Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. And he's served on many boards of many cultural institutions. And it's wonderful to have you here, Gus, speaking about something, a topic that I know you're passionate about, which is textiles. So Gus's PhD was about textiles from, from SOAS, I believe. And I also, I'm not going to read the rest of the bio because you can all find that and I really want to hear what Gus has to say. But as I hand over to Gus, um, some of you may know that I was lead curator of the Africa Fashion Exhibition and Gus was a great supporter of that. And in going around the biannual this year so far, I was really reminded and sort of hearing what Gus is about to share with us, I was reminded that the very last sentence in the Africa Fashion publication is, if Africa is the birthplace of humankind, could Africa also be the place of its rebirth? And I feel, I really felt that that really captures the ethos of what we're speaking about throughout the month of the biannual, but certainly what Gus is going to share with us. I feel there's a lot that we can learn from the continent. And so I would urge you to think about that and hold that in your minds as Gus speaks to us. If Africa is the birthplace of humankind, might Africa also be the place of its rebirth? And so I'm going to hand over to Gus now for his presentation. Let's welcome Gus. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Christine. I am so delighted to be here. And um, if you haven't got to see the Penniston cloth, got across to the Cotton Exchange, please do spend some time. And I, I, this is my very first of these biennales, but just the care that I have observed that's been invested in this has just been utterly extraordinary and to see it absolutely writ large in everything that I've enjoyed seeing over the course of the last few hours has just been um, absolutely glorious and I will be coming back um, and I feel very very honoured to be here and you know what a wonderful introduction from from Laurie and from Christine I'm so proud to have Christine as a colleague at the Victoria and Albert Museum um, she's someone who absolutely exemplifies the very best of what the v &A is but she also pushes and wants to see the institution change and shift and I adore her and admire her hugely and then seeing Laurie who's this kind of amazing catalyst for this um, amazing Biennale and just seeing someone who is just so invested in so many of the things I love, it um, is just deeply inspiring. And I'm, um, well, I, 
I get asked to do a lot of talks, but um, I have a, a really wonderful PA, and her one of her core tasks is to look in my inbox and to get rid of things before I actually see them so that uh, I'm not tempted to actually do them. But uh, this kind of popped into my inbox and just, it was a recommendation from Christine, but it was also the chance to work with Laurie as well. And so I managed to get to it before my PA and within a few minutes I'd, I'd committed. So I am absolutely so delighted to be here um, and to talk about something that I dearly love. Um, and I had the great pleasure of going to see um, the, um, the Missing Thread at Somerset House, um, which is an exhibition that tells the story of, um, of, of, of black fashion design in this country. And um, it ends with a room that is... Um, that focuses on some of the work of my own dear late brother. And I found it enormously uplifting and also affecting. And it took me back to my childhood that we didn't, as young kids, grow up in, you know, hugely kind of wealthy circumstances. We were average. But what wasn't average was the atmosphere, the the space that our parents gave for thinking about culture. And I remember in those early years, just being with my brother, with my sister, and just seeing kind of creativity and feeling it valued and realizing how lucky I was. And this talk is in a way dedicated to, to my dear late brother who grew up in the same environment and who had an amazing career, but did not get to the moment where his talents were acknowledged. And it was just wonderful to see in that missing thread, his story told, but sadly too late for him to enjoy it himself. There were long passages of my childhood when it seemed to rain for days, poor for weeks, endless, endless torrential rain that would overflow the gutters, turn our South London streets basalt black, our rose beds to crumbling archipelago, our lawns to wetlands. And then occasionally in the late spring, water would back up in the drains, working its way between the brickwork, below the door sills, beneath the window frames, spitefully testing every aperture and fissure in our home drawing ghostly ochre landscapes across the plaster ceilings before drip, drip, dripping into buckets on the landing, overbrimming basins in the bedrooms and bowls on the stairs. We'd retreat as a family to spend long afternoons hunkered down in our front room, and I'd lay on the radiator, hoping that it would never stop. The wind against the windows, the purring of the cat, the distant waves of adult conversation syncopated by that hypnotic timpani of drops in receptacles, clinks of teaspoons against China. Part of me wanted those days to go on forever, hoping the water would rise and rise until it rocked and wrestled our home from its footings, wrenched us from our foundations to bear us all away. Even in childhood, I knew that our rickety ark was the most affirming of possible starts to life. It felt not just a shelter from what the world might have in store, but the perfect place to consider and to prepare for it. And when it rained like that, I'd be allowed to borrow books from my father's library. Four shelves of calf leather volumes with gilt titles embossed upon red. Their cracked spines only enhanced their intrigue, pages annotated with blue-black ink and corners turned down to emphasise lingered-upon and much-loved passages. If we're gifted values from our parents, then it would be on those afternoons that I most palpably understood what that might mean. That I, It was then that I discerned my cultural self. And through those few dozen thoughtfully curated titles, 
my world opened. I began with gentle odysseys of Jack London and Laurie Lee, discovered the epic emotional landscapes of Dickens and Hardy, but fell in love with a glorious, beautiful volume of Herodotus, its covers faded, its pages foxed and brittle, yellow and cracked, and on those afternoons of rain, the story of Marathon, or the description of the, of the strategic masterclass at Thermopylae, fought simultaneously on land and sea between the narrow paths and the canyons of the hot gates, or accounts of contested thrones and toppled empires, of lost riches and leaders slowly but inexorably corrupted by power. They combine to make history feel real and vital. The vanity and weakness of humanity, that fragility that seems to transcend epoch and locality, could, it, could occasionally be paired with heroism and hope. And even when all seemed lost, then record, memory, history became all the more important. History that seemed to link so much that mattered, our ballast and our buoyancy. It was the counterweight to the chaos and the ambient unease, our star chart in uncharted waters. But even though I fell in love with those narratives, with those books, I knew they weren't mine. They didn't reflect my history. They didn't tell my story or the story of anyone I care for or anyone I knew or anyone I loved. Then one summer, my aunts came to visit from Ghana. And it was one of the most significant moments of my childhood. And they arrived and they immediately filled our house with laughter and chatter and gorgeous foods and cases full of yam and impossibly sweet mango and sad sweet stories and smells that I'd never encountered and would never forget, but also cloth reams and bundles and armfuls of cloth. But between the unpacking of gorgeous things were stories, stories and stories and stories. And they were stories of cloth and through cloth and about cloth, stories of family that seemed to thread themselves and around and through us and bind us tight, tying us to narratives and places I didn't know, but that felt part of me. They understood history in ways that were new to me. They'd lay out a length of a hundred-year-old silk kente or a slither of cotton or maybe a beautiful piece of a deere, and they'd tell us its life story. Laced through its fibre might be flecks of meals cooked in palm oil a generation earlier. On its surface, pearly globules of candle wax spilt when the cloth was new, trapping the intensity of fresh cobalt blue forever. They'd hold the house captive with their words. We were completely defenceless in the, in, in the face of such beauty, such poetry. Every stain, every loose thread became part of an exquisite archaeology. This textile history, it emotionally underwrote our family. And it felt, even at the time as a young child, very special. And then, with the weather, the aunts were gone. But even in the weeks after they'd left, you could enter a room and lingering in the very last of the summer air, you could still taste the gorgeous aroma of West Africa and you'd be trans transported back to a place that you'd never been. They left me longing to travel. I longed to savour those beautiful smells borne upon summer winds again. And as soon as life allowed, I travelled. Indeed, I spent 20 years intermittently travelling. I travelled and I travelled, but of course, Africa was the main focus of this travel. Travelled particularly to the birthplace of my parents. It became an obsession. I bussed up Africa's spine in my early 20s, traversed its deserts and rivers, spent time unpicking histories from the High Atlas to the Kalahari, and I fell in love with African perspectives on history. And these were histories that I thought I knew. Was captivated by new narratives that, pulled, that were pulled intact from ancient sites. 
was thrilled by sensing stories that might yet be drawn from this untouched archaeology. And what I found incredible was history was there to be encountered without fuss or preciousness. It was a continent that beguiled with the magnificent ambient materiality of its past. And alongside the stuff of great history, Africa also afforded, it, afforded its visitors the chance to feel close to affecting intangible cu culture to experiencing those living histories. From the epic oral traditions to glorious performance and masquerades, history felt real, tangible. And it would be in pursuit of these histories in form and content that would drive the greater part of the rest of my career. Looking for those traditions hunting down those evocative storytellers and those heritage-making traditions that would turn me on a hunt for my old aunts and women like them. And it was that drive, that impetus, that led me back to Ghana in my 20s, to an old dark room at the back of a courtyard in an old house a block away from, the, from a coastal road yards from Cape Coast Castle and the roaring Atlantic Ocean. This was the town of my aunts, of my ancestry, and the font of my own story. And I'd come to meet a man called Mr. Johnson, and he was, until his death, the custodian of our family's material history. And I met him in this dark parlour, and I could hear Mr. Johnson running his hand around the doorframe, feeling for the light switch. But even in the pitch darkness, I could sense that this was a small room with a low ceiling. And after what felt like minutes, I heard him say something under his breath. And there was a click of a, of a Bakelite switch in its housing. And a cloth store was filled with the hypnotic pulsing of failing neon light. And this was what I had come to this stretch of the Ghanaian case, coast to see, come to experience myself, a traditional West African cloth store. Two centuries before Daguerre and Fox Talbot, cloth stores like these held the record of many West African families. Collections of ceremonial cloth, strips of precious kente, heraldic flags and christening gowns, a family's history mapped out in a precious collection of fabric. And cloth was the perfect fabric, fabric for a, to carry a community's conjoined consciousness. Even today, in this part of Africa, there are few other objects that have such intimate relationships with West African families, as enduring as material links as, as, as cloth. Between many and the... Of, of the most important moments in families' lives are shared through connections and memories to cloth. This could be the only link that families have over generations. This could be the point of continuity, cloth. And they offered in their being a kind of corroborative history, a focus for testimony that was unlike anything else that could straddle geography and time, and yet at the same time be flexible enough to tell multiple stories. And to truly read these narratives, to really draw the gorgeous poetic subtleties of these pieces of cloth out into the open, you needed someone like a Mr. Johnson, part poet, part historian, part lawyer, part interpreter, and when called upon, he could be the spokesperson for a family. In the late 19th century, it was a generation of Mr. Johnsons who began to use their traditional knowledge in tandem with great writing to change the very nature of West African, African politics. As an implicit cultural challenge to the heavy-handed colonial control, these men published their own histories to line the walls of their own libraries that sat in their own clumps these histories would become the basis of the recognition of their own courts and which, within which they set their own precedents as the foundation of their own written laws. 
These men even reinvested in printed woven cloths as, eleg as an elegant symbol of this moment of intellectual renaissance. And demand for traditional textiles grew, driving the development of new global supply chains to respond to the needs of this generation. Wax cloth designed in Britain might be manufactured in Southeast Asia to be sold in the markets of Lagos and Accra. And when after independence, President Nkrumah was defining his new Ghana, many of his cabinet were the descendants of these great storytellers. His national narrative was based on their wisdom and his cabinet wore the cloth that had been the focus of these accounts. This cloth was always so much more than just material. It was a medium through which the accumulated narratives of families could be given a palpable form and around it developed a kind of dynamic interpretive tradition that most museums would covet. The most respected West African family West African artists from Ellen Atsui to Yinka Shonabari have dedicated much of their practice to celebrating this very history, this culture of cloth, reminding us of the very fragility and portability of fabric and how it has served as a physical metaphor, metaphor for the frailty of family and narrative. Cloth is simply unique. In the right hands, every mark, every tear, could be read, could be mined, animated. Cloth had written into its fabric the collected forensic evidence of a family's continuity, capturing in a single beautiful thing the complexity of ancestries. Fabric could give focus and coherence to the lives of people united by blood, but so often separa separated by geography and death. And yet we knew without love, Without continued use, the fabric's power could simply drain away. In its very fragility was a reminder of the preciousness of our history. Mr. Johnson reached into a drawer and he pulled out a number of pieces of fabric and he sat down and began to unravel them across his knees. I remember every image, every applique shape and form as if it were yesterday because every flag Mr. Johnson animated with a story. One of the most memorable and unfortunate things that was ever said about Africa was written more than 150 years ago, where the German philosopher Hegel suggested that Africa, as far as history go back, he said, has remained for all purposes of connection with the rest of the world, shut up. It's a gold land compressed within itself. The land of childhood, which lying beyond the day of self-conscious history is enveloped in the dark mantle of night. Like many of his contemporaries, Hegel argued that as Europe emerged into the age of enlightenment, the African continent was left locked in a culture-free state resembling Europe's dark and distant past. It was part of a way of thinking that led to the perpetuation of the idea that Africa was a childlike continent, a place somehow locked in a primitive fog without history and intellectual tradition. And it gives rise to the idea of African art being simple or created by naive cultures. But look at this, said Mr. Johnson. When Hegel wrote those words, Osai Bonsu, who's at the centre of this illustration in gold, beneath the kind of the golden umbrella. Osai Bonsu, also known as the Whale, ruled the Asante Kingdom, the powerful region to the north of the coastal Fante. And he ruled over an, an awe-inspiring and unrivaled kingdom that supplied slaves and gold to the British. But as much wealth as Osai Bonsu had, he was interested in culture and intellectual pursuits. And he attracted to his court thinkers and academics from across North and West Africa. And he acquired the name the whale, not because of the power of his court, but because of the scope of his wisdom, of his ability to dive like a great 
like a great fish into the depths of, the in, of intellectual seas. What I find wonderful about this metaphor is that it accepts that even with all of his political power, with all of his wealth and all of his armies, it was Osai Bonsu's knowledge that he was most respected for. It also suggests that though in command, he was subservient to traditions of learning, traditions of law, he was sat within a sea of knowledge, and that was where he sought his legitimacy. These cultures, rich in gold, attracted attention and trade from across West Africa and beyond, and gold became a blessing as much as it was a curse. And long before Europeans explored West Africa in any meaningful way, this area had acquired this reputation for being the land of gold, of rich, accessible seams of gold that would glisten in riverbeds after rain and would be crafted into the most beautiful objects and carried on the back of camels and sold in the great markets of the Middle East and Southern Europe. But its markets were so geographically remote as to render them almost mystical, magical, supernatural. And between Europe or the Middle East lay oceans and deserts. But the remote and unattainable nature of these gold-rich states and the lack of knowledge about them only made them more exciting and attractive to the Europeans. And in 1618, a pioneering company was formed in London with a single primary objective, to build a trading relationship with the region. But generation after generation, Europeans were thwarted as expedition after expedition ended in murder, in bungling, in confusion. Some simply disappearing without trace. A catalogue of calamity was long and tra that was long and tragic. In 1620, an Englishman, Richard Jobson, mistook the River Gambia for the River Niger and was never seen again. In 1670, Paul Imbert, a French sailor, was kidnapped and murdered en route. John Ledyard, an American, died in Cairo in 1789 before his expedition had really even begun. Daniel Houghton, an Irishman, simply vanished after leaving Gambia. And Frederick Horneman, a German academic, perished on the banks of the River Niger. Even Mungo Park, one of the most celebrated explorers of any age, was to drown after succumbing to a hail of spears in 1806. But the law of gold was potent and contagious. A decade after Manco Park's death, Thomas Bowditch, who's in, the, in this party of Europeans here, obtained a job as a writer for the African, the African Company of Merchants, brokered backing for an expedition to the Gold Coast to make contact with one of the most powerful and respected West African mon monarchs the Asantehini Osai Bonsu, the great whale, the king of the Asante. And his job was to negotiate the establishment of a trading centre on the coast from where the British might acquire and export gold. And his descriptions of the Asante capital were like the words of an intergalactic traveller making first contact with an advanced alien con culture. He was left in utter awe at the cultural complexity of the Asante state, that like Rome or Venice or London at their heights, was a cosmopolitan hive of activity, a mix of cultures that attracted the intellectual and creative elite from far and wide. The impact of cultural hybridity was evident everywhere, not just in glorious goldsmithing and jewellery, as might be expected, but in exquisite traditions of cloth manufacturing weaving and applique. Bowditch describes a gathering to celebrate the harvest of yam when all of the local dignitaries gathered. And he describes it as one might describe one of the great state occasions of the European monarchs in this period. A moment of pomp, of wealth, of symbols of state paraded and celebrated. And at its very heart, the Asantehini, or Sai Bonsu, the whale, decked in gold, surrounded by officials, dignitaries, all exquisitely dressed 
Everywhere there is gold, everywhere there is expensive cloth. The material embodiments of this culture, and it is a truly magnificent scene. But within a generation, the Asante state would have grown to become one of the most expansive in West Africa, but would have done so at a cost, fueled by gold and slavery and cloth. This would all begin to crumble. Within the lifetime of one of the youngest people here present, all of this would have slipped away. The British would have turned their small foothold on the coast into a vast crown protectorate with Queen Victoria rather than the Asantehini at its head. In, 17, in 1874, the British sent a company of just 2,500 men armed with Gatling guns and Enfield rifles to attack the Asante capital, Kumasi. Within weeks of landing, they'd captured the king, burned his palace and capital to the ground, and taken possession of the crown jewels as reparations. And with the enrichment of the British came the diminishment and the absolute impoverishment of the local people. Their king banished, their autonomy taken, their gold and textile traditions almost fatally compromised. They had to inevitably accept falling beneath the colonial yoke. Gold had made these peoples, and gold had in turn turned to destroy them. And part of the process of their undoing at the time went almost unnoticed. The opening up of the coast to the new textile and cloth imports completely changed this region in ways that were really quite profound. The introduction by Europeans of huge amounts of imported cloth, first cloth made in Europe, then cheaper cloth made in, in Asia, imported to undercut and undermine indigenous cloth traditions, it eventually had a near fatal impact on the indigenous industry and decoupled local peoples from their textile heritage. But the local population had not given up. It was not just aunts who remembered the importance of fabric. Handfuls of steadfast weavers and designers resisted the ambient tide and continued to create textiles and keep traditions alive. This almost political cultural resistance became a powerful part of regional culture as anti-colonial activists adopted traditional cloth making as a badge of resistance. And that very ethos is still evoked today by artists like Yinka Shonabari and Ella Matsui, who continue to celebrate those traditions through their work. And you can see echoes of it in the work of designers of Ghanaian descent who invest in designs that evoke that same history. From my own dear brother Joe Casely Hayford to Oswald Boateng to Grace Wells Bonners, designers of Ghanaian heritage who have continued to tell and retell this story through their talent, through their practice, lest we forget. But also perversely, the Western world hasn't forgotten. And it continues to assault these fragile textile cultures. Over decades in which I've travelled, I've seen a profound shift in the place of cloth in the lives of these communities. The profound erosion of local textile traditions, the diminishment of makers and of making traditions to the cost of everyone. And this is just a single African clothes story. There are many, but most share similar chronologies of exploitation. Today, buying clothes has never been more affordable, but whilst, whilst the prices are low, the true cost is rarely quantified. Since the year 2000, global clothing production has doubled, making the fashion industry responsible for 10% of humanity's carbon emissions. The evolution of fast fashion has encouraged British people to consume and throw away more clothes each year, perhaps as many, uh, sorry, perhaps as much as 140 million pounds um, worth of clothing goes into landfall every year. But these sorts of issues touch every stage of garment production, 
it's estimated that the world's clothes contain cotton that requires vast amounts of water and pesticides in their production. And pollutants that are a byproduct of these processes can affect health of the farmers and damage, damage surrounding ecosystems. The dyes used in production can be carcinogenic. Clothes made from synthetic materials are equally costly for the environment, as tiny pl plastic particles break up in your washing machine, releasing up to 7,000 fibres per cycle into the water system. These microplastics are so tiny that they can't be extracted from, from the water spreading throughout the food chain. Now, we might try to mitigate this envi environmental cost by recycling only for our clothes to end up in places like Ghana, in the very areas where they produced once upon a time that beautiful kente, the place of great aunts and the great whale. They've actually paid the price for our fast fashion obsession. And it's graphically exposed in mountains of material washed up on Ghana's beaches. The Ghana, the, many of these garments once donated to charity shops but put in, and put into clothing recycling banks by many of us well-meaning, but they now come to blight West Africa, a place with such a glorious textile history has become a dumping ground for some of the world's least desirable clothing. Many of the items <coughs> excuse me, donated in the UK are so cheaply produced that they can't be reused. So Ghana's coastline is clogged with toxic mountains of dumped gar gar garments that rot on its beaches. Children play on decaying carpets of cloth wedged on the sand. Much of this clothing could never have been reused, having left Britain too damaged or simply too badly made in the first place to be realistically recycled. With no means to deal with this quantity of material, vast volumes of clothes make their way to the sea via drains or are dumped at textile um, mountains like Old Fadama, where 40,000 of Accra's most vulnerable citizens live. It's a place where if you go, you'll see cattle and chickens and egrets foraging on this huge, vast textile dump, while waste pickers search for scraps of salvage. It's a breeding ground for malaria carrying mosquitoes, and the adjacent river that runs along the side is overflowing with waste which brings risks of cholera. And local people, they try to repurpose these clothes at the Cantamanto market. There are 30,000 tailors and seamstresses and dyers who repro reprocess the Abroni Wawu, the dead, man, the dead white man's clothes. And 25 million garments are recirculated every month. We perpetuate the damage to the Ghanaian people that we have wrought upon them for centuries. Nearly 40% of the 167 million pounds worth of clothes, clothing imported to Ghana, originated here in the UK. We are the world's third largest exporter of second-hand clothes. And this really breaks my heart this region was once one of the world's great textile hubs. Within my own lifetime, I've watched the fatal undermining of once great industries and cultures. The textile trade routes from South East Asia, Asia established centuries ago by British traders to undercut West Africans, continue to haunt this glorious textile culture. And almost all of the textiles that end up, all of these textiles that they originated in China, in Bangladesh, in Vietnam, and in, and in Indonesia, 
Now, it might feel like these problems are insum insurmountable, but I think some of the solutions are obvious. We simply must buy less, buy locally, wear for longer, and care more. We must care more. And for those who can offset financially and in terms of karma, we simply have to be more generous. Like the old aunts or the great whales, we have to learn greater respect for the past and its materiality if we're to safeguard the future for our children and the children of others. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Gus. I mean, where to begin? Where to begin? I mean, I, as you're settling down, I, I want to thank you for your presentation. And it was the way, it was not just the content, but I think the way in which you took us through what you wanted to share. And I don't know whether people noticed this as well, but as you started to speak, I felt this pace slow down. <laughs> And I felt this wonderful slow of pace and tempo, that, a meditative tempo that was rather like textile making. It was almost a reenactment of what it might be like to weave a length of kente cloth. Or we were speaking to the flax growers. I can see some people in the audience and this idea of growing flax, spinning yarns. And that's really what you sort of took us into that in those opening slides and with the pace of what you shared with us. Um, and what you had to say was so powerful. I feel I want to maybe begin by taking us to the underlying question that we're pondering with the biannual this time round, which is, can textile making be a regenerative act? And ask you to say a little bit more. You want us to pick up where you left off and what is the future? What is the future um, in terms of conscious fashion and reducing waste, but also what is the future for traditional textile techniques, whether that's in Ghana or indeed in the UK? Could you maybe share some thoughts on that? I, I don't think it's a case of can it, it has to. I think that we, mm. we now have to make a choice because at stake, I think, is our sector. Because I, I just do not see it as being sustainable, this constant race toward cheapest mm. and to see how we can find new markets within which we can exploit people further that we need to acknowledge that the value of clothing is not necessarily in how little we pay but in how much we invest and I think um, that the narratives which is what I was trying to to leave you with, if anything, is the idea of the narratives that surround both the making and the possession of clothes are enormously powerful. And if you think, even in this country, that um, people had handfuls of garments and many of these things would be handed down and the, the emotional connective tissue between you and your wardrobe would have been enormously powerful mm. to be handed down a coat that was owned by your mother or your father. That wasn't just about wearing a garment, it was about carrying that history on your back. And that sense of clothes being more than just kind of fabric, more than just ways of keeping warm, I think is important. Mm. Um, and for does designers who think so hard about the crafting of of their of their work that I think to produce yet less and to have it worn more and to have, have it have their garments worn with greater thought I think I think it does a level of respect for the craft so my thoughts which I try to encapsulate at the very end is that we need to buy less we need to buy locally and that we need to kind of be more thoughtful about the things that we buy. And my also hope is that alongside this, that there are, there are the kind of um, the technologies which allow us to be more effective in the ways in which we, we, um, we produce 
fabrics, um, but also the ways in which we can um, 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 recycle the fabrics that are uh, that do come to the end of their lives. You see those scenes in Ghana, and anyone who knew what those beaches looked like 20 or 30 years ago, they were pretty much pristine, mm. Mm. absolutely gorgeous. It was like paradise. And the idea that in a generation that that could have happened, and it could have happened, which is one of the, the other tragedies, being driven by people wanting to do the right thing, that we now need to go very, be very thoughtful about how we create some conscious campaigns to make people aware of the costs of them buying cheaply, but also of disposing without a great deal of thought. But do you think that real change can only come through government legislation, for example, or how do how do we lobby um, design houses beyond you know we, you spoke about Grace Wells Bonner, Oswald and so on and the work that they do, but when we think about the high street brands, does the government surely the governments the governments plural have a part to play in the way that the you know the buyers beating down the suppliers for the cheapest you know possible price, and I think the other thing that came through in your um, come in your talk really clearly was that sustainability begins with people. It's sort of people, land and resources, isn't it? So maybe where, where is the government in all of this? Well, the government, they, they, should, they should absolutely be there. And that, um, you know, one, you know, the British Fashion Council, I know that sustainability is very high up on their agenda. But I think that, that for designers, respect for their work is is absolutely kind of tied to this. This is how we, we demonstrate that this, the craft, the thought, the love that goes into the design of most clothes, even the clothes that look fairly mediocre, there are people who are thinking carefully about, about, um, about making those design decisions. And we need to slow down, both in terms of how we um, use those things, but also in how we, um, uh, the trajectories of kind of fashion seasons. And I think that is about fashion houses, rethinking. And it has happened in the sense, I think probably since, um, I think over the course of the last decade, that that sense of, of kind of the momentum of seasons has lessened. But I think we need to work with designers for them to think again. Their clothes are worthy of much greater time. And I think that, you know, fashion journalists as well, that they write about things, you know, particularly kind of um, on a seasonal basis, as if they are just fleeting, as if they have a single moment. But one looks, you look at the work of McQueen that, was produced at his heyday, it's still incredibly kind of vital and relevant. And I think we need to find the ways of just slowing down fashion and of enjoying the skills, the craft of the people in that industry more. And as you say, part of that will cut, should come with legislation. And even if it's painful, then maybe it is kind of thinking about ways in which one applies kind of you know tax to make sure that that if you want those you know either cheap things or highly luxurious things that there is an amount of money which is going back into some of the most vulnerable areas of the sector so that we can absolutely kind of secure the diversity because what we don't want is to diminish the complexity of our sector so that we we through a, through kind of thinking about the economies of scale, mm. we actually reduce the diversity of, of of things that produce and the and the artistry that is invested in them. Mm. It's really interesting, and and a few people kind of spring to mind, like Lagos Space Program, yes, um, Adore, the wonderful work with Adore, sort of re revisiting yes. traditional technique, 
applying it. I loved what you were saying about the, the, the cloth with the candle wax on it. And so it sort of reminded me of um, um, Lego space, space program and they're sort of revisiting of resist printing that is Adore with indigo but you know doing graffiti prints for example but their collections are not really collections it's sort of one thought it's a meditation on Adore that that grows organically um, and perhaps they might show during a fashion week perhaps they won't you know and it's it, they're less they're sort of finding another way of doing fashion that's less bound to seasons, less bound to catwalk shows. So producing in a conscious way, these collectible items that really honor the people that are doing the printing, the people that are weaving, the people that are making the garments. They also incorporate wrapped garments within their, I will use the term collections. So it is this kind of, as you were saying in your talk, it's sort of looking at the past and carrying traces of the past, past with us but honouring people, honouring techniques, honouring the environment. Yes, and, and building, building wardrobes as you would. Yes, a collection, a collection. of pieces, a collection yes. of these paintings. Yes. And that thinking about how you might repair, how you might pass on, you know, and, and buying thoughtful or minded of the fact of, is this a garment that is going to feel like it's out of fashion before mm. it actually kind of falls apart. That you want to know that, you know, that that a truly offensive idea of, of whole ranges of garments which are designed knowing that they will never be washed, that they are worn so few times that they are just thrown away because it's not worth the investment of a, of a dry clean. Mm. And that that idea is so repugnant, um, mm. both in terms of thinking about the integrity of design, but also thinking about the environmental costs. Mm. And so many of the areas of the world in which these, these goods are produced, people are being exploited to levels where it is kind of, it, well, it, it's borderline kind of indentured labour. Mm. And it was reproducing many of the sorts of inequalities that we saw in the colonial period. Absolutely. Um, someone yesterday was talking about zombie imperialism, this form of imperial in relation to the dumping of waste. Perhaps someone can remind me who it was, but was it Jeremy Hutchinson? Um, imperialism never dies, it just comes back in a different form, which is very much what I feel that you were speaking about. When I was working on Africa fashion, we didn't have a separate sustainability section because we realized very quickly that everyone in that show had a sustainable practice. Yes. Um, and we were told time and again that this was because vernacular cultures on the continent always were sustainable. And so they somehow, the designers in the show, had, but had they'd not engaged in the fast fashion system that we have in the UK and in America. I wondered whether you had any thoughts on that, because I'm often asked about where is sustainability in Africa fashion? It's ev vernacular. It's everywhere. Yes, it's and, everywhere. and it, it's, it's implicit to, I think, most, most areas of, of, of African fashion. Mm. Um, and, but I, I also see it here in Britain as well, mm. but it's very local and it's also in the, at the high end and you see kind of practices that are about tradition and are thoughtful and are about thinking about um, the, the sources of materials and things. Mm. And, and it's beautiful. And when you wear those clothes, you can feel, mm. you can feel the care that they've been produced with and you can be in sympathy with the narratives that surround them. Mm. I mean, I hate that idea of you put on a T-shirt, you don't know... You know, you feel, is that a natural material? You know, where is that from? What is mm. that? And I now feel kind of uncomfortable when I wear those things. Mm. And it's, you know, in, the, in that series that I made for the BBC, I was very keen to make something on the, on the, on the tote bag, cause, you know, which is an, a kind of a, a symbol of this, of us embracing something which appears like it is actually on the side of 
of sustainability, but is actually creating a situation that is even worse. And we need to consciously, at the level of consumers, think about what it is that we are prepared to put up with and to absolutely just make sure that we commit in all of our purchases to the principles that we believe in. Because it will be our children, our grandchildren, who have to find the solutions to these things. And you look at those beaches in Ghana, you know, you look at that image. A generation ago, this was pristine. Two generations ago, these people had incredible textile traditions that were, we have destroyed a culture through what we thought was kindness. Mm. We now have got to get to grips with, with this and think about this at the supply end and at the demand end simultaneously. Mm. And at the demand end, it's about all of us taking a responsibility. Mm. Mm. Because if we stop buying, that will hurt the purse strings of the businesses and that will force change. Yeah. I want to open it up to questions from the floor. Um, thank you, Gus. Let's open it up to questions from the floor. Wait for the microphones to get to you. While we're doing that, I do want to recommend, if you haven't already seen it, the Material Memory exhibit in people are nod some people are nodded, nodding in the crypt of the cathedral that really looks at this idea of um, the place of cloth in terms of storytelling, connection to the past and therefore the future. Do we have a first question for Gus? Have we rendered you all silent? <laughs> yes, yeah, so there's a question here at the front. Just uh, could you wait for the microphone, please? Thank you. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, yes, beautiful. I, I hope I get this right. Um, <clears throat> Do you think we really need to have a, think, a rethink about words like recycle? Because everyone feels like if they've recycled, it's like gold star, pat on the head, you've done really well. And actually, it's almost, it should almost be the last resort. Um, the pat on the head should be for reducing, reusing and repurposing. Because certain language, and just uh, something you said, um, the UK being a big exporter of secondhand clothing can almost sound like a positive yeah. and really we're a, a massive dumper of textile waste so is it in the language we need to be using and not seeing recycle as a win it's not necessarily a win i i, I do agree that the language needs to change mm. um, but but i also think that around it there needs to be change in legislation that i i think that we should as discrete nations find the solutions to our own our own waste and that if we were forced to deal with that yeah. quantity of of kind of of waste i assure you that we would be thinking further down the supply chain and actually being much more responsible as a nation um, and so a shift in language should come with a shift in philosophical approach and a shift in policy as well. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question? There's one here at the front, in the front row. Thank you. Sewing isn't taught in school any longer. 30 years ago, I could go into our local primary school with a, a handful of hand sewing machines and get every girl in the school unfortunately only girls, to make a simple dirndl skirt. I didn't fuss about how straight the seams were, as long as it could be pressed straight enough for them to be able to wear. And every one of those children wore those clothes all summer. They made them out of scraps of material that they brought from home. Mm. Some had bought them, some were clothes that they... We, we repurposed at that stage. But people don't do that any longer. We're not repurposing old clothes. My mm. daughter's still wearing a skirt I made for her 27 years ago out of two old duvets. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree with that. And if you, you know, you read the um, biographies of McQueen, of, of Galliano, of, you know, that whole... And you see how the thing that got them started... Mm 
was learning some sewing from an aunt, from a mother, from, you know, from a relative, and that they all began or they, a consciousness of, of, um, of the fashion industry began with them actually thinking about making themselves. And I, I agree with you, and it, it's not just in terms of fashion, but opening up children's lives to hands-on making. And this is in a time in which I know a lot of schools are going through straightened times, and one of the first areas in which they many schools cut back is in terms of thinking about visual arts delivery. And, and you know, I, I do a lot of talks and in schools, and many of these schools, particularly in East London, are beautiful. They are they've been built within the last ten or fifteen years and they look spectacular. But their art spaces so often are being shuttered because there is this huge drive to just focus on STEM and with the lack of resources in um, in education to think that the arts are probably the thing that can be compromised upon first. But in Britain, this is something that we do so well historically. This is the area that drove huge areas of the economy. And I think at this moment in which we are trying to think about our future um, um, in terms of new areas of growth, I think the new areas might be some of the very old areas that the things we do better than anyone else. I mean, all of those British fashion designers who are leading European houses, who are dominating in terms of the US, you know, those, we are so good at this. And we are good at it despite the obstacles that we put in the way of young people. So I think absolutely that this is about young people having exposure from from their families, from within their families. But around that, we should put the support in so that there might be the person who doesn't have a senior member of their family who has these skills, but who naturally has an interest. I mean, someone like McQueen, who he goes off to Newham College, and it offers a transformative platform for a young man who has been creating fashion by himself thinking that he's he's kind of strange that he's odd that it's it's something a drive that is is almost unnatural and he finds an environment in which he can express himself and he flies and think of all the potential McQueens out there who could be transforming areas of our sectors in profound ways even What's this now, what, a decade after his death? That label is still employing huge numbers of people, bringing huge amounts of money into our sector. Think of the people, that the McQueens, that never got discovered, that never were encouraged, that this is an area where I just think, as a nation that is going through a period of transition, that we cannot afford to allow this human resource not to be nurtured and so from the aunties and grandmas who nurture the young right the way through to thinking about the formal learning opportunities to the art colleges that we need to invest in creativity and even if you don't do it as a profession I think having a population that are aware alive to design is really good you get to this, the sort of, the sort of, oh, sorry, it's no longer on the screen, but you get to the, set, the stage where people don't respect clothing, in part, I think, because people don't respect how complex and how thoughtful you have to be to create something like that. It's only the fact that we're exploiting others that we can have a T-shirt that costs five pounds, but the amount that has gone into creating that is, well, it's incalculable. And I think, you know, we need to invest in the young in making sure that they have an awareness 
of what it takes, of where, how where garments come from, of how you could contribute to customising, to repurposing the clothes that you have. I think these things will only be good in terms of the wider mental health care of our, of our young, but also in dealing with issues of sustainability. Gus, on the back of, thank you, that's a brilliant question. On the back of that, do you want to share a little bit about v East and the prioritisation of making and yeah. how central that is to your ambitions for v East? Yeah, and I, I was working as a director of the Smithsonian um, in Washington, D.C. I was in charge of the National Museum of African Art and um, got a phone call from London about this new bit of the Victorian Albert Museum, a new collection centre which will house 280,000 objects, um, a thousand archives, and a single one of those archives is a David Bowie archive which has in itself tens of thousands of objects within it. An opportunity to come and to craft um, a vision around that and then simultaneously to create a new museum um, alongside it. And I thought this is something that I want to be a part of. And what I absolutely loved about the ambition was that the core audience would not be a traditional museum-going audience. The ambition was to make this core audience the youngest and most diverse audience that any national museum has ever focused upon. And so it's, it's on the Olympic Park in East London, on the, co at the confluence of four of, mono, uh, uh, four of the most culturally underserved in terms of subsidised culture areas in Britain, some of, the, um, some of the most financially challenged communities as well. And we are now kind of tasked with making a proposition that will, I hope, encourage the next generation of McQueens. And so I can remember being that age and growing up in South London and thinking a visit to a space like this would be nice, but having the guts to come up the stairs and come into a space like this you know, it requires something. And so how do you get a generation of teenagers that have so many other things that they would be wanting to do as competition to come of their own volition? And so I have made a commitment to go to every single one of the more than 100 schools in the four boroughs that surround our sites and to try and spend time with the more than 100,000 young people um, in those schools. And we're taking objects so that they can handle things and they can, they can really get a sense of the kind of the tangible presence of really gorgeous, beautiful things and what it takes to make things. And we've centred our narratives around making because whoever you are, you have a relationship with making. And uh, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's a fantastic job. I mean, it's, it's scary the amount that we have to do in such a short time. But it speaks to all of these things, that this is a generation who feel a little bit lost and they think that we've let them down and they feel, you know, probably with some justification that things aren't as they should. And they're looking for the areas where they can begin to build a positive narrative and make a contribution. And I think many of them would love to get involved with things like fashion, but it is, this is a, a generation who are deeply moral and are driven by issues like sustainability. And they look across our sector and they look at the waste and they look at the, you know, the presentation of fashion as this thing which is in some way trivial and also so fast that it's not thinking about the repercussions of what it does. I think what I'm really determined that we do is that we can slow things down, that we can talk to designers about design and the reasons why they do things, that we can bring young people into these processes 
and expose designers to their priorities as well. And I think that their huge desire to see greater equity, to see a sustainable future for our planet, I hope that they as future consumers will begin to really shape the thinking of designers and fashion houses, but also to also the arts educators and the universities and fashion courses to just think about how we build sustainability in to all we do and all the approaches in terms of education. There was a question here, the lady, two on this side actually, there was a lady with the wonderful head wrap first, your hand came up first and then the person in the green just in front afterwards. My main intention of coming to this festival was to come and see the Peniston cloth. Yes. Um, it connects to my own history, my own ancestry connected to enslavement and, you know, indigo dyeing. I've been researching indigo plantations in Jamaica and I felt, I don't know, I felt emotional but it's, I mean, it's been interpreted in such a respectful way, but I felt emotional. And so the conversation here, I found it really grounding, you know, to actually move into the cultural identity of cloth. And that, you know, what you were saying, Gus, it's, we have profoundly undermined the cultural identity of cloth. Christine, you talked about Adire, and there's a language to the pattern making of that indigo cloth created by um, Yoruba dyers. So my question is, um, and Christine said, Gus, you, your, your, the pace, the rhythm of your delivery just mirrors kind of slow textile making, but there was also a poetry to your delivery, which I really appreciated. And I wondered if I could just ask you to lean more into that. And do you wear kente cloth? And if you wear kente cloth, how do you feel when you wear it? And for you, Christine, could you share a little bit more about the African fashion exhibition, you know, the, 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 the richness of the cloth, you know, you cura curated that wonderful exhibition. Could you share a little bit more with us? Thank you, thank you. Shall I start? Yes, uh, that gives you a moment to take breath. Thank you for that question. It's lovely um, to be able to share a little bit about the thinking and the centrality of cloth um, to a project like Africa Fashion, which officially was two years to curate it, but I feel like I've been working on it for a lifetime. I think that the closeness between cloth, cloth making, and storytelling, and poetry, and the open-endedness of all of that, um, the fact that um, equity, I think, is embedded in all of those things, it's, it's being open to, you know, rather like stitching and unstitching when you're making a fabric, making a garment. That to me is rather like the act of making poetry, the open-endedness of poetry that allows the mind to, to wonder, you know, in both senses of that, wonder, W-O-N-D, W-A-N-D as well. Um, and that, I think, is foundational to my own creative practice prior to Africa Fashion, it's part of my heritage growing up in a Jamaican household with that wonderful lyrical country of Jamaican slow way of speaking, that appreciation of beauty in the everyday life that is about, it's fine to be extra in terms of dressing. It's all about almost overdressing because why not? We are worth it. It's a way of showing the world who we know ourselves to be and that's often at odds with who the outside world tells us we are. And so some of those um, points that I've just shared that are embedded in my own research, but also come through my lived experience, that all, found, that all created the foundation of Africa fashion, which we knew, or I knew, back in 2020, um, when everyone was on lockdown, and I was just at home in my little studio and I still have the post-its. The story had to be about abundance rather than lack. It had to be about the politics and poetics of cloth. It had to be about the unbounded creativity of global Africa. And those were the foundations. 
that built Africa Fashion. When the team came off furlough and we started to finesse the story, but textiles absolutely were present. They had to be. You can't tell a story of African fashions without looking at the power of textiles in the moment of independence that Gus spoke about and the historical um, pointers or the framework of Africa fashion began in that independence moment and the revisiting of African people, re-looking at their textile traditions, wearing them with renewed pride in being African and black in that moment of independence. But then also looking at contemporary creators like Lagos Space Program in Nigeria, like Ewa Mete and her meditation on hand-woven, home-produced cotton in Mali. Textiles absolutely held the story together. Um, in my own creative practice, poetry is always present, and it's whether it's, you know, creating a moment of silence and poetry last summer at St Paul's Cathedral, which was um, in response to one of the monuments there, I was invited to be part of the 50 monuments, 50 stories, um, intervention at St Paul's Cathedral and it was a moment where I could bring textiles, poetry and silence, that slower pace, together. But I think it's all rooted in my country Jamaican upbringing and I'm going to hand back to Gus on that note. <laughs> but I, I do think though that peoples of African descent, that what we've been through, the kind of the epigenetic trauma that we share is so great, but the thing that we we share as a counter to that has been, I think, a particular way of holding on despite all of those challenges to our heritage and our stories. And in those cultures, the place of the story is incredibly important but the place of the storyteller, I think, is pretty much unique as compared to other cultures. And that idea of savouring the words, respecting the, the speaker, of understanding how speaking your truth is giving a gift to someone and that the listening to that is a kind of mark of respect as well. And I think that building those kinds of relationships for people for whom that's the reason why I wanted to talk about that Hegel mm. quote the idea that there was no possibility of us having history of us having a story that was worthwhile listening to and yet at the same time despite it all if you turn on a radio, the chances are that you will hear beats, you will hear rhythms that have survived the transatlantic trade, that they've survived colonialism, and they came back in the face of imperialization to absolutely bestride the world. And that requires a kind of deliberation, a kind of slowness, a kind of respect and so when I think of these stories I think it is worth savouring them and it is worth taking them at pace mm. because it's the thing that we haven't been given which is time and I think yeah. you know we deserve it beautiful thank you and there was a per the person in front in the green thank you uh, yes it's um a very topical um, textile question relating to the imperative global green agenda. Since the second half of the 20th century, we've seen a relentless rise in synthetic fiber uh, fabric multifarious end uses uh, in worldwide sales market share, which now represents around 50% of world consumption. Um, considering its ever-increasing massive adverse ecological footprint, both in terms of pre-consumerism manufacturing pollution effects and post-consumerism uh, 
worst scenarios, how can we practically slow down uh, this uh, escalation? I think, yes. No, but I, I think I, one of the glorious things is if you look at the focus of this Biennale, and it is that very thing, and if makers can begin to absolutely set the tone and this becomes absolutely part and parcel of the way in which people see this industry. It's not about a kite mark. It's more fundamental like that than that. This is the ethos of this sector. We believe that these things are not important. They are critical to our future. And out there, the thing that I feel so empowered by is standing in front of school, of schools full of young people who we have written off to some degree. If you read kind of various bits of the media, like this is a generation that don't seem to care. They care so much about this. This is something they feel so passionate about. And I think for the bits of our sector, of, of, in terms of design, that speak to their values, I think that will be one of the necessary components of your success. So I think the component parts of a more positive future are there, but we now have to kind of, you know, galvanise, you know, government, some of the bigger areas of the sector that are driven by money to realise that out there, the broader constituencies that they depend on, whether for votes or in terms of the marketplace, are absolutely behind this. Okay. I think we're going to have to end there. I, I, I'm so sorry, I can see a few more questions on this side. Um, but let's thank Gus for what's been such an engaging <laughs> afternoon. Thank you.